Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from John's Gospel, John 6, beginning in verse 32. And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. This is the time in our service where we humble ourselves and pray. I want to invite you uh, to bow your head with me. Uh, perhaps you want to uh, bend your knee as well. If there's room in the pew, uh, please feel free to do that as well as we pray. Father, we just come before you and we bend our, our heads and our hearts where we humble ourselves before you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are our salvation and our hope. Thank you, Lord, that we have hope, that we have you. Lord, that you walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death. Lord, that you are with us, that your word tells us you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for those promises. And we, we hold to them, God, and we proclaim them and we celebrate them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our salvation. Thank you, Lord, that you are the bread of life. For it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. And all God's people said, amen. And pray. I was just going to read you a quote that I found. Um, when I first started working for Guidestone, I was, it was Jerry Bell who hired me. I was scanning documents and uh, we had stacks and stacks of applications through the years that needed to be digitized. And so we were putting those uh, through a scanner. And I ran across a quote by a son who was helping his mom fill out the application. And it so moved me. I wrote it on a post-it note because, you know, everything's really confidential. Guys, so y'all tell him I did this. But I didn't, I don't even names or anything. But I, I wrote this quote down and he said, thank you for including widows in the Mission Dignity Program. Such action is a tribute to the wives who served beside their pastor husbands as partners in ministry without pay. For a person like Donna, um, uh, many of these women did not work outside the home. In fact, they served literally right alongside their husbands in ministry, and they did so without pay. And so when we say that they're surviving on their Social Security, many of our uh, ladies that we serve um, are making between seven and $800 a month, and that's what they're surviving on right now. And so it is, it is logical for us to come alongside them and help them out on a monthly basis. And so once I got hired into uh, Mission Dignity, it was a perfect fit for me. It allowed me to do um, great ministry work to these uh, people, but um, also help to provide for my own family. And so today, as you give, I want you to understand that Donna is, is a true representative of all the people that we serve. They are humble. They are, they've been hard workers. They have given to their last breath to the kingdom of God. And that is who we take care of. And I, I just want you guys to know, I talk to them every week. I, um, I, I see their applications come through. These are, these are the best of us. When it comes to the kingdom of God and the church that is here on earth today, these people are the very best of us. They have served faithfully and selflessly for a very, very long time. Please bow your heads and let's pray. God, we just... We thank you. God, we thank you that before these these uh, that served you were ever born, you had um, a mechanism in place to take care of them when they got to uh, their retirement years. And I thank you, Lord, that um, as they come to the end of their life, that we have the privilege and the honor of helping them to end well. God, I pray that um, you burden our hearts. God, that you um, put on us uh, exactly what you would have us to give. And Father God, I thank you so much that you and your divine providence, you knew all and you saw it before it was ever laid out. And I thank you so much that you are taking care of them. I pray that you use us to do that. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, turn in your Bibles, please, to John's Gospel. John chapter 6. Verse 
beginning in verse 26 this morning. And so as we uh, turn there, let me kind of get you up to speed on where we are. The, the, uh, Jesus has just fed the 5,000 by the Sea of Galilee. Uh, they, in, earlier in chapter 6, uh, Jesus doesn't want to send the people home, and he says, let's feed them. And Philip says, well, here's a, a, a kid with uh, you know, five barley loaves and, and some fish, but you know, what are you going to do with that? And, uh, and so, but, you know, brings it to the Lord, pray over it, feeds the 5,000, uh, has leftovers, uh, collects the leftovers. So eating leftovers is biblical. Sorry, guys. And, uh, uh, and then the crowd is, is excited, and Jesus and the disciples leave and go across the Sea of Galilee. Um, and uh, we, we kind of take it up here, uh, verse uh, 26, the, the people have come and they're, they're looking for him. They leave from Tiberias. They go across to what is home base for Jesus, to Capernaum. Um, and they catch up with him. And uh, in, verse 20, in verse 25, it says, They found him on the other side of the lake and they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? So he's fed all these people. They're excited. They saw this miracle. They've listened to this great teaching from Jesus. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You're looking for me not because you saw miracles or saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then they asked him, well, what must we do to do the works of God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Father, I thank you for your word, and I ask God you help us to understand it. Um, and Lord, I pray that it would find root in us. Uh, Lord, let your will be done in our hearts and our minds through your word. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So Jesus is telling the the crowd that comes, you know, when you're when you're doing evangelism, you want a big crowd. You, you get excited. I mean, Billy Graham, you know, fills stadiums full of people, right? And so that's that's pretty exciting. When it says earlier in this chapter that five thousand men were fed, they're not counting the women and the children. Um, and everybody's together. They're all and and Jesus has performed these miracles. He's done this teaching. We've been to the Sea of Galilee. It, it's uh, you know, water is like a natural. Uh, speaker system, if you will. Uh, if, if you're out in the boat a little ways, the, the sound travels farther over water um, than it will just through the air. And so you can set a bunch of people on the hillside, and if there's water between you and them, that, that it, it carries. So Jesus has done this great teaching to all these people. He's fed them, and then they come looking for Jesus. Now, you'd say, well, hey, if they're looking for Jesus, that's a good thing, Right? The thing that is different between Jesus and Billy Graham or any other evangelist is Jesus already knows their hearts. Amen? He's God, so he knows why they're there. And they're not there looking for something spiritual. They're not there saying, you know, my life is incomplete. There's something missing. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter how good I have it. I, I just need, I, I need the Messiah. I need a Savior to save me from my sins. There's not this conviction. There's not this sense of I need something more in life. What it is is, hey, we got fed. Let's do it again, right? It was free pizza and buffet, so you know, let's 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 hit it. And so, it wasn't pizza, by the way. It said bread, but I'm trying to never mind. Look what it says in verse 27. Excuse me, verse 26. I tell you the truth: you're looking for me not because you saw the miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your what? Mm hmm. Don't work for food that spoils, but food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Now, Jesus shifts and says, okay, look, the physical, obviously we live in a physical world and the physical is important, but don't let that be your whole focus. And if that's all you focus on, you're missing out. Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God and he came, but he came to do it in hearts individually. He didn't come to physically bring the kingdom of God. Now, he's coming back again. He will bring the kingdom of God physically, amen? 
Some of you in Sunday school were studying in Isaiah, and it's talking about uh, the millennial reign when Jesus is actually on earth reigning and he's in charge. Um, and, you know, there's no controversy over who voted for Jesus and who didn't, no ballots to count, right? He's just it. He's king. You don't vote for a king. Praise God. Amen? Okay, you can say amen. I don't care if you voted for Trump or Biden. At least you're glad it's over. Amen? So Jesus is in charge, and what he's going to do in the millennial reign is bring the kingdom of God into the physical world. You know, he's doing that now, but he does it through you. If you know Jesus as Savior, he lives in you, and you're expected to bring his kingdom wherever you go. Jesus tells them, don't just work for food that'll spoil. Go for something more. Uh, it, it's likened to what he said in, in a little bit later in chapter 8 when he tells the woman at the well, you know, if, if you knew the kind of who you're speaking to, you'd ask me for water because I've got water that whoever drinks from this water will never thirst again. She says, well, give me that. And Jesus is speaking figuratively, right? He's not saying that he's going to literally give her water and she won't be thirsty. He's saying there's something that is even more real than the physical, and that is the spirit. That is who you are. You're not just physical, amen? I, I told you about this last week. If you cut my arm off, I'm still me, right? Cut this arm off, I'm still me. Cut my legs off, I'm still me. At some point, you cut my head off. I mean, you get to me at some point because I'm not me anymore, right? But, but in other words, the physical isn't what makes you who you are. It's the, it's the soul that God put in you and his spirit living in you, animating that, that makes you who you are. Amen? That's why when somebody dies at a funeral and their body's in the coffin, we always say, or I always say at a funeral when I'm preaching, I say, look, that's not them. That's the tent they lived in. It's the house they lived in. But who they are is now with God in heaven. Amen? Because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But their body's still there. Well, that's because that's the tent they I mean, that's the fit. There's something more, Jesus is saying. Don't get hung up on just getting some bread and some fish. Don't miss out. Can you imagine hearing Jesus speak in person and teach? And then all you're really thinking about, not what he said, not what he taught, but, hey, I wonder if we can get some more fish and bread. Like he owns a Long John Silver's franchise or something, right? No. Well, don't miss it. So they say to him, well, sir, give us this bread, verse 34. And, and he says, well, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and who who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven to do my, to do my will, not my will, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Let me read that again. Wow. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Who sent Jesus? God the Father, right? So he came down to do the Father's will, he's saying. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. The Father's will is that you trust in Jesus as Savior, not that you're good enough to get to heaven on your own. In fact, in verse 34, I think it is, uh, verse 32, actually, he says, I tell you the truth, uh, Moses gave, didn't give you bread for him. Look at verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. That's Jesus. And and. Well, wait a minute, Jesus, wait a minute. How, how, how do we get that bread alive? How do we work our way to heaven? What, what can we do to get this bread? Is there something we can try hard enough? And maybe if we pray enough or if we give enough to Mission Dignity or First Baptist, that's it. If you give enough money to First Baptist Church, I can guarantee you a spot in heaven. Do you believe that? You shouldn't because it's a lie from the pit of hell. Because your financial bank book, praise the Lord, has nothing to do with your heavenly dwelling. Amen. It may be how nice you live here, but it surely doesn't have anything to do with how you live in eternity. And Jesus says, you want, to, you want to know what work you need to do? Here's the work. You can work your way to heaven by this. Believe in the one who sent him. Look what it says in verse 29 of your Bible. What does it say? Somebody read it out loud for me. 
Verse 29 of chapter 8 there. Excuse me, chapter 6. Jesus answered, the work of God is believe in the one who is sent. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. What's the work? To believe. In other words, not that you're doing, just to trust in who he has sent and put your faith in him. You trust, when you get on an airplane, do you offer to help the pilot? Do you want to go up front and say, you know, it's been a little bumpy back here. Let me show you how to do this better. No, right? You just tighten the seatbelt and you trust that they're going to get you there, right? See, that was an act of faith. When you got on the plane and they shut the door and you felt that and they took off, it's all over but the crying now. You couldn't change it if you wanted to, amen? See, the belief happened when you said, I, I, not the purchasing the ticket, not, the, not checking the bags, but when you got on the plane and you took that seat and they shut that door, that's belief. That's trust in. You trust that pilot to do what he's been trained to do, what he's been called to do. You see, what Jesus is saying is, you trust in who I am and who I've been, what I've been called to do, because you can't do it yourself any more than you could fly the plane yourself. You can't get yourself to heaven unless you believe and trust in Jesus. Amen? Well, we're celebrating the Lord's Supper today, and that's what it's about. That's what the, the bread and uh, the, the body of Jesus is about. When he says uh, in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Is he talking literally? Hmm? I take the Bible literally, but Sometimes Jesus is speaking figuratively. What? Well, the psalmist says, and the trees clap their hands for the joy of the Lord. Do trees have hands and do they clap? The Bible must be full of errors. No, of course the Bible's not full of errors. It just thinks you're smart enough to understand that God's creation worships him and the trees would clap their hands if they had them, right? Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Verse 40, for my Father's will is everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And at this point, verse 41, the Jews began to grumble. I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. Well, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? And Jesus answers, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Verse 60, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Because he says, well, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, has anybody ever read that and thought, what? What does he mean, eat my flesh? Maybe you've heard that in church, so it just seems now. Think about if the first time you heard it. You know, to be a Christian, you have to eat the flesh of Jesus and drink his blood. What? I was watching a movie, and it was... Uh, a Christian in India, and it was like in the 1800s, and the, the, the Indian says to him, he says, you know, I've, I, I know a, 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 a white man. He, he, he's a cannibal. He's like, what? He goes, he says he eats the flesh and drinks the blood of Jesus. And he says, oh, it's a little different, isn't it? What does he mean to eat the flesh and drink the blood? Does he mean literally that his body becomes? So let me give you, there's three uh, teachings that, that Christians can in, interpret this. And then I'll, I'll tell you how, how we interpret The first is called transubstantiation. Big word, you can write that down if you want to. It'll probably do you no good unless you're watching Jeopardy. But transubstantiation says that when a religious priest or pastor or whoever is in charge prays over uh, the bread and the wine, that it becomes literally the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. I mean, that it transfer, that it turns into literal blood and flesh. Now, that's what Roman Catholics teach, all right? We don't believe that way. You might say that they take the Bible even more literally than we do, because Jesus says. But look what he says. Uh, well, there's that view. Now, there, there's, the, there's what's called consubstantiation. That's transubstantiation. Consubstantiation, some of you, I know I'm losing you, but hang with me. 
or what Lutherans and some others believe. And, and they say, well, it becomes the body and blood of Jesus for someone who really believes in Jesus. So if you're not really a believer, and you, it's just a piece of bread and it's just some wine, right? Just grape juice and bread. And that's called concept. In other words, for the believer, it becomes literally. And then there are those who, uh, as we believe in, in our church here, and I think correctly, there are those who believe, well, look, we believe that it is symbolic of Jesus and that we're eating this bread and we're drinking this juice or wine in symbolic union with the Lord, that we're part of him and that he's part of us, that there is symbolism and a connection there. And look what, look what Jesus says in verse 61. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, have you noticed that the, the disciples of Jesus grumble a lot? Good thing it's not like that anymore, huh? Does this offend you? Verse 62, what if you, what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. What does he mean they're spirit? The flesh counts for nothing. What he's saying is, I'm speaking to you about spiritually being connected with me, spiritually eating my flesh and drinking my blood, in the spiritual sense, becoming one in essence with me. Not in a literal, physical sense. Do I think the Bible, do I take the Bible literally? Yes. Do I believe the Bible is an errant, infallible word of God? Yes. Do I think Jesus was teaching here that when I pray over this Lord's Supper, that when you guys take it, it's the body and blood literally? No. It's symbolic. It's reminding us who we're connected to. You know, Jesus didn't tell people to go out and build beautiful churches. I've seen the Sistine Chapel. I've seen the Vatican. I've seen uh, and worshiped with uh, folks in Brazil that it's literally a pole barn with a roof on top and nothing on the sides. I mean, from one end to the other. And can I tell you this? It didn't matter because God doesn't care about the building. He cares about the person. Amen? And so he said, when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you know, it, it is something that can be done anywhere in the world. The poorest of the poor will eat something and the richest of the rich are going to eat something. Amen? Doesn't matter how fancy you have. You don't have to have stained glass to have the Spirit of the Lord is what he's saying. When he says, what I'm speaking to you is spiritual, he's saying, hey, don't miss the truth that I am the way of salvation. Don't be hung up and say, well, wait a minute, what about bread? He, he again, is trying to relate to those people. Don't get confused like some of you look right now. Right? The ones wearing masks, I can't tell if they're smiling or sticking their tongue out at me. All right, so, verse 65 he went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. And from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And he says to the twelve, do you not want to leave too, Jesus asks. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So Peter got it, which if you've studied anything in the Bible and know anything about Peter, that's a miracle. Amen? He's usually, I mean, he's first on the boat and last off every time because he just doesn't get it. But here he gets it. You're, you're the only hope we've got. Well, why did all those others leave? Well, Jesus made it hard on purpose. Being a believer can be hard. Amen? Standing up for your faith and saying, I identify with Jesus is tough at school or at work. Not saying those jokes or, or drinking with those guys or uh, stealing, you know, padding your expense account like everybody else does. Those are tough. And when you say, well, I don't do it because, you know, the Lord knows. What? So Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this blood, you proclaim my death until I come again. We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. I'm going to ask the deacons to come. They're going to prepare this tray. We're going to do it a little differently. Again, COVID has affected everything. There is a little, in your pew, you'll see a little 
juice and bread thing. Uh, it looks like a little plastic cup. And as the deacons come and prepare this table, let me give you some instructions. Do you have your little plastic cup? Right. So there's two, two layers on that. Um, can I borrow yours for a minute? Thank you. You have another one? Okay. So this little tab, bend that tab down. I don't know if you can see. But it's got a little point. Bend that point down and then back up. And do you see how the, the, the clear with the purple stuff kind of separates? And you can peel that back. And you see that little wafer? Right? That's the body of Jesus. Be careful. Right? When you eat it, you'll know it's not really flesh because it tastes like styrofoam. But that's not the point, is it? So you're going to peel that first. Then after we take that, then you're going to peel the other. But don't peel them both because you'll get to the juice. And um, I don't want you to get all messy. So, all right, that's the instructions. If, if you accidentally pull it off, it's okay. You won't. Oh, you've got another one, you said. That's, nothing bad will happen to you. All right, so we're taking the Lord's Supper, and as they prepare the table, um, I want to ask you to do something, prepare your heart. So the Lord's Supper, what we're going to partake, what we're going to celebrate here, is for those who have trusted Christ as Savior and those who have followed Him in believer's baptism. So if you know and have publicly confessed that Jesus is your Savior and you've been baptized publicly, then you're welcome to participate. You may not be a Baptist. We don't care. If you've trusted Christ as Savior and been baptized, then you're allowed to participate with us in the Lord's Supper. If you haven't, or if you're not sure, then just don't do it. This is not, no secret spiritual rite that will mystically get you into heaven. This is just a reminder for believers that we're connected to the Lord, that we belong to His, Him. So uh, our pianist is going to play for a few minutes. They, they've prepared the table, but Paul tells us in Corinthians, don't take the Lord's Supper. Don't, don't participate with an unclean heart. Don't go there and do that if, if, you, if you've got sin in your life. So I'm going to ask you to bow your head. And would you just ask the Lord, God, is there anything in my life you don't like? Is there anything? And, and ask him to put his finger on that and just speak in your mind. And then in your mind, would you confess that to him and ask his forgiveness? Well, we just, Lord, in our hearts to you, confess our sins and ask, Lord, that you would forgive us and make us worthy, Lord, because of Jesus to receive um, this special time of fellowship with you and with other believers. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.